Hi, welcome to this third course in the BBST series. By now you know the pattern of these courses. I start by acknowledging the many people who helped us create this course. Then I tell you where you can find the slides online. And then I point out that this course is part of a set that presents the context-driven approach to black box testing. Here are the objectives for the BBST series as a whole. And here are the objectives for this particular course. Now this is a survey course. We're going to cover way too much material, most of it at a superficial level. There are more slides for this course than in the first two courses combined. That's what survey courses do. Your challenge is to actively manage this excessive flow of information. You have to consciously decide how to spend your time. There's a bunch of stuff in this course that you should notice and pay enough attention to that you know basically what it's about. Pay enough attention to see how it fits into the overall big picture of the course and then file it away for future reference. There are a few things in this course that you should work with a little more intensely. I want to give you a sense of a range of techniques. There are lots of different techniques that have different strengths and weaknesses. I want to help you develop an overview, a map, an idea of how you can pick a set of techniques whose strengths complement each other. This is an important kind of knowledge for context-driven testers because we take our goals from the project from its stakeholders, its staff, and its resources. We choose testing approaches and techniques to meet these goals. To do this well, you need to know a lot of techniques so you can pick the right few from your toolbox. I'll present most techniques in bare bones detail, just enough to help you understand how each technique fits within some conceptual organizing structures. If you want more details, they're probably available in the 500 references listed at the end of the slides. I'll cover a few techniques in more detail. I've picked these particular techniques partially because they're well known, but mainly because they're so different from each other. You can use these as anchor points in your mental map of this large complex space of test techniques. In this course, you should gain a good understanding of these few test techniques, but you probably won't gain much skill with them because to develop skill, you have to find ways to apply your knowledge and get feedback many times. That's how you get good at a technique. We'll focus on developing skills with specific techniques in our next courses, probably starting with one on domain testing. Somya Padmanabhan, Doug Hoffman, and I are writing the textbook for that course now. As we move from course to course, we don't change just the content of what we're teaching. We also change our learning objectives. We figured when you started the BBST series that you probably didn't have much experience taking online courses. So we worked on that as a focus of the first course. That was actually the greatest emphasis of the first course, how to learn well online, how to handle tests, assignments, exams, online videos effectively, and how to give peer reviews. We also covered a lot of basic testing and computer science knowledge. In the second course, we shifted gears to testing skills. In particular, how to skillfully investigate and describe bugs. In the process, we taught a lot more about peer review, which shows up on this chart as skilled social interaction. This course is more focused on broadening your software testing knowledge, but as you'll see when we work with tours and specification-based testing, we're also interested in improving your active learning skills. We see active learning as essential for competent software testing and for surviving survey courses. Here are the definitions of the terms on the last slide course skills, learning skills, and so on. And here's the list of topics that we'll cover each day. There are two tracks every day. One track we take a detailed look at one test technique. The other track we take a broader look at test techniques in general, looking for ways to classify them, compare them to each other, and understand how to choose between them. Today we start with function tests and test tours, and we race through a long list of techniques presented within an organizing structure. There's a lot of material today. By now you've learned the time management skills to focus your coursework around the quiz questions, the assignments, and the study guide. You should apply those time management and prioritization skills to every lecture of the course. Otherwise, the information load will drown you. There's a reference list at the end of the slide deck. Later, when you're testing a product, come back to these lecture slides. We summarize each technique on one slide. Several hundred references at the back add details for those techniques. When you find a technique that might be useful, Look up its references to figure out how to apply that technique to your project. Here are today's readings. Focus on the two papers on tours. Skim the test techniques chapter from lessons learned in software testing. We'll return to it later. So let's get to our first technique, function testing. Function testing is about testing the program one function at a time. Now I use the word function broadly here. If it's something the program can do, it's a function. 
So how do testers find all the product's functions? Well, if you have a draft user manual or a specification or a help system, those are excellent sources for some of the functions of the product. But remember, remarkably many functions go undocumented even when the documentation is intended to be thorough. So you can also walk the user interface. I'll give you an example of doing this in a moment. And if you can start the program at the operating system command line, you might find new functions in the command line options. For example, you might be able to set the program into debug mode. And that might affect what information you can get and how all the other program's functions work. At the command line, look for different help text for the program's different modes, like debug mode. This can point you to new features or options, and it can give you a different understanding of the features that you already know a little about. Another way to find commands is to reverse engineer the source code files. For example, it's a very simple example, you can often find a text file with error messages. These will point you to features that you might not have noticed if you were just walking the user interface. It's time to demonstrate a walk through the user interface. This slide briefly summarizes what you'll see. Function testing involves two broad types of tasks. First, you have to find all the functions you can test, and then you have to come up with tests for each one. What I'm demonstrating here is the task of finding all the functions that you're going to have to test. This is a beta version of OpenOffice Writer 3.4. Let's see what we can find out about it. This is the main window that I'm working with. You can see that it has menus, lots of menus and it has toolbars. And it also has context sensitive menus that come up when you click on some item in the user interface or in the document itself. It has scrolling commands, cursor commands off to the side, and a menu that controls the window on the desktop. As you tour through the menus, you'll find that some take you to submenus. Others take you to dialogues. Other menu choices take you to commands. Here's an example, the digital signature command. This should sign the document, but OpenOffice won't let you sign a document unless you've already saved it. So sometimes this command will create a digital signature, and other times it just takes you to another dialog. Now this is important. Something you think will result clearly and unambiguously in a specific state transition might usually do that, but do something entirely different under special circumstances. Writer also gives access to databases, such as the bibliography database and a mail merge database, and other user-created databases. You can also bring objects into your document from other programs, such as Olay objects and plugins and movies and sounds. When you embed one of these objects and then click on it, it brings up the program that created it. So for example, insert a paint object, click on it, and you get the paint program. Your challenge is to understand the relationship between commands in the embedded objects programs and the behavior of OpenOffice. Can they interfere with each other? OpenOffice will also let me attempt to insert objects that won't come in. So here I'm trying to insert a spreadsheet from TradeStation. As you can see, the insertion will fail. You can find even more commands on the Customize dialog and the Options dialog. The Customize dialog lists commands that you can bind to menus, toolbars, and the keyboard. Notice all the categories of functions. Each category brings up a list of functions that you can place on a toolbar or a menu. For example, the View category includes 39 functions. The Options dialog also provides many new commands and changes how existing commands work. Finally, you can create macros, your own commands. Now, as part of your function analysis, ask this. What capabilities of OpenOffice are involved in creating, debugging, running, blocking, and deleting these macros? Are all of those functions independently visible in the user interface? Or is this another place to look for new capabilities? This UI walkthrough probably reaches most of the commands that you can reach through the user interface. So that was a demonstration of a feature tour. The way a tour works is that you decide on a theme, a hunt for a type of attribute, and then you go look for it. A feature tour looks for features, an error message tour looks for ways you can get the program to throw error messages, and a variables tour looks for all the program's variables.